Hi. 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 I'm Chris. And I am Cherie. And welcome to our live chat video series. This is something that we do about we uh, monthly. We pick a topic, talk about it, and then we take questions. So this is one of our longer form formats. If you're watching the archive, this is not going to be a produced piece. Yes, and these we're not going to be editing out crazy little bits or glitches. And then when we do Q and A and stuff, it'll probably all just be here in the recorded archive. So. <laughs> Unproduced. If you're looking for produced content, we have lots of that in the go, go look at our things. other playlist. We have Live lots of archive. other content. Yes. All right, tonight's topic is dealing with travel burnout as a nomad. <laughs> we, you're supposed to talk about it now. So, yeah, we've been on the road 11 years, and I think we've burnt out a few times during that, that span of time. And we've also you know managed to, to reinvigorate ourselves and get re-energized and get back out on the road and we still love nomadic life you know we're, we're now dividing time between boat and rv and we can't see going to a fixed existence Not but there have been certain days where the <laughs> burnout was there and we're like we're done with this so we want to share our years of experience of how to you know the signs of being burned out how to deal with it and yeah and um just some of the things that can cause it. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you watch blogs and uh, video content and Instagram and Facebook, and people are constantly posting these amazing pieces of stuff. Life is all unicorn and rainbows on the road for the most part. If you if you look through the lens of, of bloggers and Instagram, it's either big crazy drama, like because people love to share when they're broken down on the side of the road, or it's all like perfect, wonderful sunsets. Mm -hmm. And the everyday life, and particularly the everyday grinding down burnout, really doesn't get shared a lot. Because when you're burnt out, you don't tend to be have the emotional <laughs> energy to share much. And right. it's not that interesting. Yes. Um, but it happens. And uh, almost every long-term nomad that we've encountered has had it happen at least once. Um, and it happens. It, uh, so some of the reasons that travel burnout can happen is just keeping too quick of a pace. You're trying to see too much in too little of a time. Well, if you think about it, you're you know particularly when people first hit the road, they've just got that I gotta do it all feeling just burning in them. They're like they're in a new place, and there's their top five restaurants they want to go to, and there's all the must do tourist places, and then they've got family and friends who want to see them, and then combine that with the people who are still trying to work or raise kids or, or teach kids on the side and suddenly they're running at two three hundred percent plus they're doing something that might be completely new to them which is rving or living Boating. on a boat or or being nomadic and it feels great it's a high at first and then that first burnout is usually the worst it's, yeah. just <laughs> it's one that can take a lot of nomads yeah. off the road pretty quickly yes. um there's a, a, a term that you'll see tossed around, and I think it's actually now in the Oxford Dictionary. It got added. It's FOMA, F-O-M-A, all caps, and it stands for fear. FOMO. FOMO. Oh, sorry. F-O-M-O. Fear of missing out. F-O-M-O. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> FOMO. Um, and it's especially if you've got this bucket list of things that you want to do, or you're watching all the social media people go into these amazing places, and you just have this list that's growing and growing and growing of all the things you want to see, all the breweries you want to hit, that amazing restaurant that so-and-so had dinner at. Um, and, and then you just have this fear that you're going to be missing out, or while you're doing that, you're going to be missing out on something yeah. else. And soon enough, you're burnt out, because you're also having to do your own laundry, you're having to <laughs> clean house, prepare yeah. meals, constantly researching what your next location is going to be, where you're going to get there, the logistics of getting there. And pe particularly people who have a deadline, who's like, say, I'm doing this for one year and then the money's going to run out or I've got to go back to my other job or, you know, th some of those, that, that just pressure of like, you've got to see it all before the time runs out. We've, we've actually met people who, their goal, their dream was to take their kids to all 50 states, but they would pass through, wake their kids up in the middle of the night, pose them in front of the 50, the state <laughs> sign, put them back asleep in the car, and they drive on again. The kids won't even remember seeing that state, they'll, but, they'll, they'll but they the got pictures. the check marks. They, they, the they, they, they got the pictures. And uh, one way that we've made 11 years sustainable is recognizing that we can't keep that pace all the time. Now, there are times that we do keep that pace because... It's fun. Whether or there's other there's timelines and deadlines and things like that that are creeping up on you, and you just have to do it for a while. Um, and some of the signs that uh, travel burnout is creeping up on you is that you ha you become a little less interested in the things you're seeing. You're like, oh, another hike, another or, museum. Or you're like there and out. You know, it's like okay, been here, done it. It's like um, no, we we drove across the country to see this amazing thing, and now we're cutting it down to a, a like a. 10 minutes stop no no that, that's a sign you're burning out right there is <laughs> if you're rushing away from the things you 
theoretically love. Um, another sign that I notice in myself is I start to dread uh, leave day. So if we've got a campground reservation or a marina reservation, we know we have to be leaving our spot at a certain time. And it's like, I really want to be here another four days or another month. or And I'm just dreading that getting back out on the road feeling, that navigating traffic, that what's going to break next feeling um, on your vessel. <laughs> Particularly if it's a long trip ahead of you. It's like, mm. oh my god, i got a thousand miles. Ah! And that's actually, you got to start breaking that down into mm -hmm. smaller pieces and longer stops. Um, and yeah, it's, there's also can be pressure if you're sharing on social media, there can be pressure to feel like you have to be traveling and having amazing experiences for content for your viewers and readers. Um, <laughs> I know that's something we have to resist the urge for is, especially when Parkland's is like, like right now, we've been still for almost three months in the same spot and we're getting some people saying, oh, I wish you'd just get on again. I'm, I'm, I miss the travel content. I'm like, it's okay that they you, miss it as long as they don't feel like they're poking yeah. us and saying, you get out there, do something, dance for me. But monkey. even if you're not feeling that pressure from your viewers, you might feel that you're you're losing traction, especially if you're trying to build a social media presence. Um, you might start to feel that. Or your friends and family might start to feel that if you're not writing home with or sending you pictures all the time, that somehow you failed on your mission right. that you know oh it didn't work for you and you know so you made all these plans to hit the road um, you shared all this excitement and then six months out you're so tired and you have this fear that if it, word if, of that gets back to yeah. your fa friends and family they're gonna say aha I told you so yeah if, if you if particularly people their first long stop like they're stopping for a month or two just to catch their breath the, the people back home might be like they're just embarrassed to admit that because they didn't line up with their initial mm -hmm. plans so yeah, it's real, um, especially also if you're working on the road. It can be especially difficult to navigate because if you're still working a 40 hour week or more or less, um, you have to have that time to get work done. You also have to have time now to learn how to navigate, learn how to balance um, when the good campground spots are, where they are, what type of uh, stays you like best, uh, what sort of length of time you like best, and you're going to make some mistakes along the way mm -hmm. as you learn, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah um, that's a, yes, that's perfect. But, but uh, you know, if you're, you've got work commitments, big deliverables, conference calls, needs for connectivity, and you're not sure if you're going to have enough internet access mm -hmm. when you get to a location, these are constant stressors um, and all these new logistics on the road that you also now have to manage. Um, and for people especially that are leaving like a office job and trying now to work remotely, whether they're starting a business, generating new income streams, that's a, these are all big life changes. So you, you've added in nomadism with entrepreneurship or self-employment um, and a new family structure too mm -hmm. and how you're all living yeah. in a small space. All that, that traditional rigid structure of your week is out the window. And one place we really see burnout happen is if, if there's kind of a mismatched load in couples too, mm -hmm. where you've got like one half of the couple is still trying to work and the other half, they're now kind of starting to go into that, I'm on vacation mode, they're, they're, they're not working. And the so half that's working sometimes is trying too hard to keep putting up, a sh to, to keep up with both sides rather than just say, hey, you, know, you go do touristy things. I don't want to hold you back and I'm going to do the work thing or, you know, yes, yeah. And another difference between um, individuals in a family or a couple is personality differences. Um, Chris and I, um, if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs typology, it's just one of many ways of uh, personality assessment. I'm an INFJ. He's a... XNTP. And if you know what those means, mm -hmm. I, I'm very introverted, so my social energy can drain sometimes a lot quicker than his can. So if we've been in a highly social situation, I'm going to tend to get burnt out a lot, a lot sooner and be craving going somewhere with loud, a lot of social energy before he does. Right. Um, but our JP is one of our biggest differences. Um, J, that means that I am more inclined towards planning mm -hmm. and having a schedule set. And for me, I'm actually, let, if I'm starting to burn out, I want to get things off my schedule. We're going to talk about this in, like, in how you deal with burnout, mm -hmm. but it's for her, she's burning out. She wants to lock in dates and schedules and know when she can catch her breath. And I want to clear the slate. I want to have. I don't. I don't want to know what I'm doing tomorrow. I just want to think about mm -hmm. this moment. That's a PJ difference. And so yeah, that's something we're constantly navigating because we might both be having burnout. But in we our, deal with it different ways. And, but our solutions are very different. Right. And so that's a great segue into what are the solutions for travel burnout besides not traveling? <laughs> I mean, there's fear then that okay, so 
if you get travel burnout, does that mean you're no longer a nomad? You're no longer an RVer or a cruiser? You're and that's not, cool not true. Kids anymore, yeah. That's not true. And don't fear that. Um, almost every long term nomadic person I know has had to take a break in some way or form or change things and, up. And and particularly a, a break just because you set out to be like this fast paced, you know, small minimalist RVer, you can change up everything and still be a nomad and still be mm-hmm. following your heart and your wanderlust and stuff. Um, some some of the things that we've done over the years is like this really makes it up. Like we took parked an RV and said, let's do five months in the Virgin Islands. We rented a little cottage and lived uh, stationary, but not intentionally long term stationary. Yeah, We're in, still in nomadic. A completely exotic new place. Um, we've changed up our modality of travel. So we've had three different RVs. We've sized up because we started super tiny yeah. and then went up um, eventually to a 35 foot motorhome uh, to give us more space and, and to change the style of travel mm-hmm. that we're doing. And, and and also in a large part to slow things down. As we went to bigger RVs, that was more conducive to slower travel, monthly stops in places. And which we didn't do very often. We, 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 <laughs> which it, at least it enabled us to do. And, and we, we did have to keep catching ourselves, like, no, no, sit down, do a month, do a month, it's stop. okay, we have a comfortable month. house we can it's do that in. And, of course, now we're mixing in a boat as well, mm-hmm. which was a long-term dream of ours. Um, we've also just, if we're on the road and we're just, we're tired of the cramped small space, we're tired of campgrounds, we're tired of um, dealing with being on the road and rage drivers for an area, <laughs> we've actually just gone and sought out a, a vacation rental by owner yeah. And rented a place. We found a place with RV parking and just rented the place for a week or two yeah. and enjoyed. With hot tubs and on yeah. the river and stuff. You don't feel guilty about taking a vacation from your RV or your travel lifestyle because that's your life and you deserve a vacation from mm-hmm. your everyday life. And you know, break that up. Um, another thing we, we do often, and it's actually been a really big relief sometimes, is book a cruise. And even though the cruise might be three months away, having that kind of in mind suddenly takes away it's kind of a, a fuse that lets out a lot of the pressure of the burnout yeah. as a, as a w- someone who's full of wanderlust and I love exploring new places um, a cruise hits that for me in a vacation style because we're still traveling we're still seeing new places maybe not at the pace that we normally would like but we're not having to arrange logistics cook dinner we have someone making our beds so mm-hmm. it's a vacation but we're traveling nomadic. but it's minimal logistics mm-hmm. and it's a good break for us and we really enjoy cruises um, in fact, you might want to look at the Escapers cruise coming up at the end of November if yeah, you want so to join some cool RVers, RVers, which we might go on ourselves. So, yes, yes. Um, very, that, very likely. So check yeah. out the Escapers cruise. Uh, that's the end of November out of Fort Lauderdale doing an Eastern Caribbean. Um, great cruise. Mm-hmm. We've been on that one a couple times. Um, <sighs> other ways to, to change it up. Um, is sometimes you just need to just find a spot and be still. So we, for the last... Well, okay, you can change up the pace of travel. So if we're going too quick of a pace, we may then just start throwing in some two-week stops, a month stop. Even if that means canceling plans, you know, your sanity is worth a lot more than burning yourself to the the ground trying to rush and fit in all your summer dream. It's like, yeah, maybe Mm -hmm. you take take three weeks Mm -hmm. and skip a state, and it'll be there next year, hopefully. Well, yeah. I (laughs) mean, last year we did uh, the Northeast for the first time and we had all these grand plans that we're going to go we're going to go see Niagara Falls we're going to do the Finger Lakes we're going to do the Adirondacks we're going to do Vermont we're going to do New Hampshire we're going to do the mountains here the Green Mountains the White Mountains we're going to do Maine we're going to spend you know we did a lot of that but we cut a lot of it out too and that was smart we got to the Adirondacks found a great campground that had open availability and you you know we said this is perfect we're staying here for a week instead of what our original intention was was to go do two or three days at different parts of the area. Sometimes you just have to say, "I I just want to be still in a beautiful location <laughs> and, and focus on this one location for a while." Um, we, for the last two years or so, we've not taken more than I would say much more than maybe three or four weeks in any one location, mm-hmm. and that was starting to weigh on us. Especially, we really hit a travel burnout last fall, and that was at the same time we started ramping up for our boat hunt. Not a great time for that. Yeah, because we had all we had a lot of places we wanted to go to see boats and research boats and get ready for boats. And part of how we dealt with that was we set in mind that, you know, if, if we're going to find this boat, but we're going to let ourselves make it be a floating conduit first and use that, you know 
not instantly start doing the Great Loop, not instantly tackle too, too many projects, though we probably did, but we're going to mm -hmm. let it just be a home and float someplace uh -huh. and get used to it. And that's been great. So it's been three months now? Yeah, well, four? it'll be three yeah. months beginning of October. August that we've been in one location and we are six weeks in one location before that and it's been uh, really good just to be still to go to the same restaurants more than <laughs> once um, and like get favorites and get to be known by some of the locals and yeah. people say oh you want your usual like yeah. how often does that happen not as no magic don't get that <laughs> very often. often and uh, now after you know basically just three or four months in this area we're finally ready to start moving on it's like it's we've caught up to ourselves which is great let yourself have that so for us, we just allow it to happen. And don't consider a failure. You are still a nomad. There is nothing that says that you have to move every X number of days to be a nomad. Um, all that being a nomad means, whether you're an RV or a cruiser, you're doing house sits, um, whatever your style is, all it means is that you've designed a life of mobility, which means you're not necessarily f uh, fixing, uh, fixing yourself to one location. You're leaving yourself open the availability to move on when you feel ready. And that's all it means. Um, I think one last tip I want to leave is don't get tied in by labels. Um, I've yes. said it before, is labels are best when they're used as descriptions of what you're doing, not prescriptions for what you will be doing. Right. There's, don't lock yourself in. Yeah, and, and, you know, and actually, I kind of feel bad for some people who kind of incorporate their style of travel into their identity too, too much because then they feel pressure not to be a no their <laughs> rv is in their name they can't switch it up um or something like that so i'm, I'm glad we've just been tech nomadic because we're not going to give up on the tech or the nomad so times. yeah we're just the style and the flavor and the pace that's what we like to change all right we're going to bring out a bottle of wine um <sighs> while we're doing that feel free to start queuing up your questions i see some of them are already there and uh, Jake will start queuing those up for us so we can start answering them fairly quickly. But I want to use this opportunity to remind you that uh, we love doing these video chats. We love providing information and we also do enjoy wine. Um, if you would like to say thank you, we of course love your comments. Uh, we love uh, getting uh, emails from you saying thank you. Um, but if you would really like to say thank you and inspire us to keep coming back is we do have a leave a tip button. Uh, you can go to technomadia.com slash thanks or at the bottom corner of every page on our website there's a leave a tip button and we do so appreciate those contributions. Um, they let us know that you not only appreciate it but you really appreciate it. <laughs> and it keeps us inspired to keep doing these. Um, we are opening this evening a bottle of Big Smooth. It's got a felt cover. It's got a felt label. It feels really yummy. I'm going to switch over to the question. Um, okay, so let me see. Get the word wrap going on these so I can see them. Where is the word wrap? So Logan would like to know, would we consider sharing our RV on a site like Outdoorsy or RV Share? So these are sites that you can rent other people's individual RVs um, or you can rent your own out. And we would absolutely never, ever consider renting our RV out. Uh, ours is a classic vintage bus. It's very unique and it would take us hours to train someone to even operate it. It's uh, not turn and go. No, ours no. is not a turnkey. Let anyone drive it. Now, if you have a more generic RV, that might absolutely be an option so you can rent out your rv make some money with it yes. while you're not using it there, there are cheers cheers here's to nomads you. and not burning out mm -hmm. wine sometimes help too much too much wine though can lead to burnout mm -hmm. yes definitely moderation <laughs> and everything there, there's very few people that we would ever trust to mm -hmm. have our rv just because it's so unique but if you have something completely generic we know people who've rented out their airstreams and stuff to mm -hmm. you know and or, or put them into mm -hmm. little trailer lot b and b type things mm -hmm. Um, Colleen would like to know, should I start with a small RV under 20 foot? I own a pickup truck. Um, I, I can't answer that. I don't know you or your travel style, but we do have a, a video webinar that we did. I believe it was back in January with our considerations for selecting your full-time RV and the things to think through on that. Um, everyone is different. Uh, there is I no one size fits all solution in RV sizes. I started solo in a 16 foot and you know, that mm -hmm. size works and we big works. It's all depends. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Jonathan would like to know, is there a method you have found to slow down the burnout? I think we just covered that yeah. in the last section. Well, and so. particularly underline the words slow down. Yep. That is just... Yep. It's <sighs> adjust your pace. Yes. Adjust your pace. Um, Jim would like to know, off topic, um, how do you handle taxes? Um, we file taxes like everybody else. Yeah. Um, we're domiciled in Florida where there's no state income tax. Um, we file our federal taxes online. Yes. Um, not too hard. Just not too hard. If we quick, end quick, up quick. staying in a, in a, in a state, um, you do have to research the states that you stay in and what their rules are for state income taxes. And if you are have to owe them, so we do a little bit of research on that. Uh, like we avoid California because uh, even working one day there, you'll owe them state income taxes for any income you earn or any work that you do that might produce income. So we try to avoid California. We try to avoid California as a result because we just don't want the complication. But yeah, you do have to research it and it's, um, you know, work with a, a CPA who knows a nomadic lifestyle and taxes so that uh, you advise correctly for your own situation. Yeah, they, actually, the Escapers have been doing a nice series of oh, uh, yes. nomadic CPA, uh, or, or CPA for RVers and stuff, yep. um, covering a lot of these issues. They've got a great series to check yeah. out. Go to uh, escapees.com and go to their articles and blog series, and it's under their financial tab. And there's a great, great series there. They've got a full-time RVer who's a CPA who's been sharing a lot of information about taxes. A lot of tips. Uh, for taxes on the road. But it's an awesome series, and definitely check that out. Um, Sabine would like to know, have you been grounded by weather trapping you in your rig? Um, we, we've been through some big storms, you know, there have been, certainly been storms that we couldn't drive in, and we've had to pull over on the side of the road and wait out a few times, or been in, you know, RV parks, we were hunkered down. I don't think we've ever evacuated to a shelter, but we've, we've eyed them we've up several times. Like, yes. You know, always know, if you're in a tornado area, know where the, the blockhouse shelters are, they're usually labeled, just, yeah. just in case. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a laundry room, or the bathroom, or a social house at the, the RV, uh, or campground uh, you know just make sure you know where you can go if there's really inclement weather if you're in a tornado zone usually they're designated um, we've been through a tropical storm in the RV intentionally we decided to stay in the area we had family member uh, going through medical stuff so we decided to, to risk it and stay um, but it was not a like, it, get, it was not a like Oh no, tropical storm. It was just like, we're going to be dunked in rain, tropical yeah, storm. Yeah, it was so. 40 mile per hour winds and about three days of yes. intense rain, and we found a leak. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a great way to find leaks. But yeah, that's one storms. That's one reason we went to a larger RV is because, yes, you will encounter bad weather that you don't want to be outside in. Um, and the larger space makes it easier to deal with. When we were in the super tiny RVs and bad weather but, came, yeah, that, oh, that, that was horrible. Being Or, or just, yeah, long streaks mm -hmm. of. of, of, of constant drizzly rain and stuff that leads to a lot of burnout is being trapped inside and actually sometimes just going to walmart just to walk around and have a space around you if you're trapped in super hot heat or there's rotten go shopping. wind yeah just go shopping find a mall find a walmart find any place you can be inside an air condition in yuma when we were in yuma in the summer trapped in yuma there were like people just go to walmart during the day just because it was indoors or Lowe's. We're just or Lowe's. Doing home projects we're yeah. in Lowe's and home Depot. And, or just you just go to you don't even care what store you're in. just like oh, it's a big place i can walk it's cool i'm not trapped inside a little tube <laughs> uh bird dog would like to know our opinions on work camping so work camping is basically working f uh, from your rv mm -hmm. uh usually there, there's so many kinds of work camping um there's Work camping in which you're basically volunteering for a few hours a week in exchange for a free campsite. There's work camping where you're being paid by a campground to do like yard maintenance or registrations. There's work camping where you're being hired by a company to do work and they're paying for your campsite, like working at Amazon right. uh, and one of their fulfillment centers or the sugar beet harvest up in, um, I think that's in North Dakota, North Dakota I think, I think yeah. it is. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff working in theme parks and things like that. Yeah. Um, it's a great way to supplement your income. Um, it can actually be a good way to avoid burnout because it gives you a way to stop in one place. Like mm -hmm. we would always look, well, we, we did um, um, hosting and being tour guides at a lighthouse in Oregon two different years. And every year we'd be kind of like rushing across the country to get to that. But we're like, oh, we're going to have a still... month and a half in just one place mm -hmm. to catch our breath that is pristine and yeah, beautiful and amazing with and no pressure to leave. Fun. Yeah. Um, we've also, we have work camped at, at Amazon. We did a, a, a winter there. <laughs> and that could burn you out right there. But it was an interesting thing. Yeah. It was kind of, because we're entrepreneurs so set by our own schedules and our own deliverables. It was kind of fun to not be responsible for decisions or creation and just being told, 
put you, this you, in a box. You're a robot. Put this in a box. Cool. And it was kind of fun. I, I, I looked at it as going to a Zen meditative retreat and boot camp because you're, you're walking around a lot and being paid for it. Um, so that was a great break. Um, as far as work camping as a primary income source, just make sure that, um, like if you're doing trade for campsite, make sure that it's worth your time it's worth your time um we love to volunteer so if we're going to be volunteering we want to be doing it towards a cause that we believe in and we're not considering it really income or a way to offset expenses um but you know if you go look at if you're volunteering 20 hours a week and there's you're a couple so that's 40 hours a week and you're getting a site that they that the campground sells for 500 dollars a month well you're working at way below minimum wage so just make sure that that's how you want to be right. spending your time if you need to be earning an income a lot of the times um you know, working on your own stuff or finding a remote job is going to be a lot better and just paying for the campground fees. Uh, we don't do much work camping anymore just because our obligations with our work are too high. Uh, we found that when we're working full time and trying to work camp or volunteer, it's just too much for us. <coughs> that actually did burn us out a bit. Yes, sometimes. we did. Actually, the second time we were at Cape Blanco at the Lighthouse was when we were uh, launching our book, the Mobile Internet Handbook, and our website, RV Mobile Internet, uh, back in 2014. and. We're like working 40, 60 hours a week trying to do that and volunteering. It took it, the fun out of the volunteering It part, really yeah. did. So we, we actually had to resign a month early. We talked with our camp hosts and everything else like that. And it was a slow season anyway. They were cool with it. Uh, but we just couldn't keep the pace. It was, you know, we're working now 80 hours a week and not <laughs> having fun at any of it. <laughs> um, Marcus, how do you ba balance work with travel? And it's a constant struggle. Mostly, the, the most important thing is is to try and step back every so often and listen to yourselves. Talk, you know, have conversations. You know, recognize, call out the other person. Like, I think you're seeming kind of burnt out. I think you're getting on edge. And if you can bring it to the fore and actually talk about it, it really helps bring that um, balance back. It's just mm -hmm. shine just a light being, on it. being aware of it. Yeah. Um, and slowing down your pace of travel. Um, it's really tough to get a lot of work hours in. Um, and get travel in. So when we're working on a big project, uh, whether it's a rewrite of our book, um, or we're you know, producing a lot of guides, or we have a big deliverable, is we time that for when we've got stops that are still and are non-social, because <laughs> it's really hard to be in a social situation with a lot of RVing friends around us, or family, or things with, with obligations. Because when we work, I mean, we're working 9 to 5. And I don't mean 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We work 9 <laughs> a.m. to 5 a.m. sometimes. Uh, on we hand off between each other, yeah. It gets intense when we work intense. <laughs> yes. Uh, but we like to, like, batch up it if we can. That, that's actually up. one of our tricks for avoiding burnout is we'll intentionally burn really hard for a short period of time. Get something done. Just, like, burn through a project over the course of two weeks. And then the project's done, and you know we're not kind of dragging it out over a month or two. And so that's that's it's it, intense. It's really hard to do, but it, it helps us sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, how off how often do you move on average? Greg asks. Um, I don't think there's really an average. Um, when we're in the RV, we prefer stays that are five to fourteen days. Yeah, we, we with an occasional monthly tossed in we used to have what a um a two 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 rule a two tra travel oh, or something and t t you know just every time we travel we would never do one night stays we try to do two nights and now we're feeling that that's still too fast and three nights or five nights is just a much more practical and then maybe if you travel you just do just just get it done you know get like you know 200 miles and then stay mm -hmm. five days 200 yeah, miles we, stay we, five we, days. we found with the rv uh, the last two years is we balanced out just trying to find minimums of four to five days was about the uh, what we would do and if we were just doing a night, uh, it that was just a, a parking lot stay, uh, not doing setting up at a campground, not unhooking the car right. or anything like that. Um, we did a, a week long RV trip back in May, uh, and it was a lot of work. We were doing cellular gear testing with that with our <laughs> RV <laughs> mobile internet site. That was definitely a risky we did, for burnout. We did three state parks across the state as we repositioned the bus from the west coast to the east coast to get it into storage, and we're working you know ten hours a day at each stop and then you know having to drive in between each of these locations and we in a week we any re rest and relaxation we had accumulated just got spent in that week and it took us most of june to recover from that yeah yeah that's it's a lot of work mm -hmm. so james wants to know how do you recommend trying out nomadic life um go on the road 
Yeah, and, and actually, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things you could do if you don't want to invest in an RV or, or sell the house. Or sell the house is, is go do like a long term VRBO or house sit someplace and like just go someplace completely new and try it out for a month. Mm -hmm. Or if you have an RV that you're using recreational, try going out for a month or six weeks or something like that. Um, you know, I, without knowing your specific situation, it's hard to say what your options are, but you know, think creatively. How can yes. you uh, try out the nomadic lifestyle? What would give you that feeling yeah. of giving it a try? And, without and, and, if you, and, and, and buying you, a beater is also another way to yeah. do it. Something mm -hmm. that you could almost consider mm -hmm. disposable, buy the go, like the, just the junkyard mm -hmm. RV, just gives you a taste of the experience, something you're not gonna invest a lot of money in. But it's a good way to just try out the basics. Mm -hmm. uh, does Kiki burn, get burnt out? She <laughs> gets burnt out every single day at 3 o'clock when her humans will not feed her dinner. And she has to beg and beg and beg. She does get bored sometimes, <laughs> I think, in certain locations where there's just not enough cat things around. She, she has had places where it's just like the cat's ready to move before we are. But um, mm -hmm. in general, she's pretty adaptable. Yeah. Um, Marie would say, have we taken our bus to Mexico? Why or why not? Uh, the boat is named Why Not. <laughs> um, no, we have not taken uh, the RV to Mexico, and it's mainly just because we haven't had the time. Um, yeah. To do Mexico, you have to get your insurance. Um, there's riders, and there's a lot of costs yeah, with insurance it's, and permits. It's not super complicated. It's just never quite lined up for us. Yeah, the times that we've been in the Southwest uh, in winters, um, we've just been so yeah. enamored with Arizona and New Mexico um, that's and we're only there for three or four months it's just there hasn't been the time to make the effort to go down and, there and it and doesn't seem worthwhile to do just for a week or two and particularly because like the, the places that I'm really called to in Mexico that I, I someday I would love to get down an RV all the way down to the tip of Baja and that's a big trip I mean you got to really go for it and I'd like to dedicate the time and I you know again it's like something I don't want to do until you have the time to do it right I don't yeah. want to just like cross on the border. Get say, a check, hey, box. check done. No. Check box done. No, we're actually thinking at some point we might buy a smaller RV that's more nimble and go back to smaller RVing. Um, take that down to Baja, explore down there for a long time, go back to Burning Man. I'm not taking my bus to Burning Man. <laughs> and then maybe drive it up to Alaska. You know, we then, loved RVing up to Alaska and then leaving it stored in Alaska as a getaway without doing the big drive. That's kind of one of the long-term goals. That might be mm -hmm. 10 years off, but that's a long-term yeah. goal. <laughs> so then we'll actually have three vehicles, a boat, yeah. a bus, and a little nimble get-around beater RV. Uh -huh. um, Blase says, how cheap can you get a boat capable of looping? Um, I mean, Skipper, you... is it Skipper? There, there's a guy who's actually written about that um it's one of the there's main... a lot of people out there was a guy who just completed a loop on a dinghy he bought a 16 foot dinghy put a bimini on it mm -hmm. and he just completed the loop doing it so there yeah. we know people who are doing it on a paddle board yeah but as um, far as like more practical people mm -hmm. there there's there's um a, one guy who's blogged and written about his his guide to like doing the loop on a budget and he him and his son they bought like a five thousand dollar sailboat mm -hmm. put about a thousand dollars worth of work into it and they spent like eight hundred dollars in fuel so you can do it really yeah. cheap if you want to and a lot of it's really depends is how handy are you mm -hmm. and how mechanical are you how much you know because how I've, much creature comforts do you need right it, it's all a personal thing we started looking at boats for the loop we started looking at things in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range and we quickly found that they were in much rougher condition than we were comfortable taking on. We have already gone through taking a rough old bus and uh, modernizing it and renovating it. We didn't want another project. Right. So we decided it was worth just spending more for something that was right. more the shape we wanted to start we, out with. We, we particularly, and actually that was a, a factor in our burnout is we were looking for a comfortable condo that we can move with us it, to do the Great Loop. And we didn't want to buy a, to buy a boat that was immediately going to be a big project, or something that would be ultra minimalist. We've done ultra minimalist travel before, and and if it's anything, fun. It's, yeah, fantastic. it's very fun. But we're like, we've done that. We want, let's let's get something more comfort. comfortable and I, slow I, travel centric. We, we're loving having a bathtub and being able to take a hot bath. Yeah, that's kind of oh, crazy. It's, we it's, have a bathtub down here. It's it's nuts. <laughs> we have a trash compactor. I mean, these are like weird things. I've never like, I, yeah, strange. Uh, so uh, we great. have a guest room. That's really weird for us. Mm -hmm. It's a great follow up question. As Jim says, was burnout a factor in buying the boat? Um, the boat was always in the plan, so it wasn't burnout that led to buying the boat. But the specific boat that we ended up buying was specifically a result of the burnout we were feeling during the boat hunt and realizing that we needed a change 
in our nomadic lifestyle that um, was comfortable for staying places a month or two at a time. So we went from, okay, we're going to do the loop over a year or two and kind of do more of a typical loop or pattern where you might be in places for a couple days at a time to, no, we want to go and find marinas, take advantage of the lower monthly rates and stay in cool city, uh, city centers where we could walk to stuff and be there for a month at a time and then maybe anchor out for a couple of weeks, find the next cool city and repeat and take a very slow pace because we yeah. were tired of just rushing through places and not getting to know the places we're mm -hmm. visiting. Um, and yeah, so the burnout led to deciding that we're ready for a completely different pace of nomadic travel yeah. and that that could be compatible with the loop for us. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jack would like to know, when are we leaving the marina? So we are paid up in this marina until early August. And uh, so we are making plans. We are ready to be in motion. We just, he, he's still fresh out of the shower because we just finished the Davit install on the dinghy. It's right behind us now. So <sighs> so that that was one of the things that was holding us in place is we mm -hmm. didn't want to go to the Keys until we had a dinghy. And once we got the dinghy, we couldn't you know transport it, carry it with us easily until we had the Davit set up. And the Davit got held up in customs and... A little complicated, but it's finally here. Got it installed just <laughs> half, 45 minutes ago, and um, it will be uh, that kind of opens the door for us to head south. Yeah, we're thinking we're going we're gonna to do the keys. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, Jamie would like would like to know: Is our burnout from travel or just being in the RV full time? And it can come from both. Uh, for yeah. us, it comes from both. Um, yeah. We get tired. We're not just nomadic and that we like to be in different places. We also like changing up our living space. Mm -hmm. And um, we're really surprised that we did six years in the bus without getting tired of it. The, the, well, we did change up the bus itself, though. I mean, yeah. we, we completely remodeled the bus from stem, stem to stern. Um, but being in, particularly when you're trapped by the weather in the rv you know, first off we had in a small rvs and we get a little stir crazy when you're trapped small and then in the bus when we're stuck in summers and the air conditioner is droning right over our heads and we're in this little metal tube and you really can't get outside comfortably that does lead to a little bit of burnout when, when we're like you know out in the desert and it's beautiful and amazing desert southwest and the temperature is incredible and the you know, winter there that's the exact opposite of burnout it's bliss it's heaven and and stuff like that so depends where you're at um, okay. What is a good way to avoid burnout while work camping? Um, make sure that you've got a clear understanding of what the work camping gig is before you go in. And if it's not meshing, we've heard so many stories of people, they get to the work camping gig, maybe they've spent the last of their cash and gas to get there, and um, the work camping employer just really isn't fun to work with or isn't sticking to the original intentions, and you get burnout just because you're working far more hours than you thought you would. Um, leave. Tr try not to leave yourself in a position that you have. You're trapped. Don't get don't, trapped. Don't don't get trapped into like don't spend your last dollars to get to a work camping gig. And 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 don't spend your last hours working for somebody who you're really despising. I mean, it's you're it's better for them. It's better for you just to say, hey, my house has got wheels. Uh, this is not working. I'll give you a week or two's notice. And just remember, work camping gigs are not. <laughs> it's not, not a career. It's not a career. You're probably not getting letters or recommendations. There's there, there's right. no really contract or commitment with a lot of the right. gigs. And, and if there and is, know about it and know what the right. penalties are for leaving early. But leave yourself the out that if it's not working, to, to leave. And, um, and, and one of the things for burnout-wise, and I wish there was a lot more work camping gigs that were, like, the reason we love the Oregon State Parks is they ask for a one-month commitment. And I can do anything for a month and not burn out because it's still novel and new and exciting. But once, like, the idea of work camping for five months straight, the same job over and over again... Would, I, I mean, it burns me out just thinking about it. So, so find out what your personal balance point is there. Tony would like to know what percentage of time in the RV is spent in RV parks versus boondocking. Um, so we actually have a third level in there, and that's public campgrounds. I, there's a distinction between campgrounds and RV parks for us. RV parks tend to be commercially owned. Um, they tend to have full hookups. They tend to, for us, they tend to not be... Uh, as well spaced out for privacy. Yes. Um, we tend to minimize those unless there's a reason for us to be in an area and when that's the only option. Um, we love boondocking, but it's, it's not always it's not um, across the country, yeah. so it's not always an option. So like we, we've gone basically months on end in the desert southwest mm -hmm. in California and Arizona, New Mexico and stuff, boondocking 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've also gone months and months on end of 
paying for campgrounds every night. There's so it's, yeah. it's, it it all yeah. depends on where you are and what your current pattern is. Yeah. And we we've we've we every our, every our end of year wrap ups document each yep. year and every year yep. is very different. Yep. Yeah. Uh, if you go on the blog and under travel, I would have year end wrap ups of each year, and you can go and, and look at it. And it really depends on where we're traveling and what mode we're in. But our sweet spot is public campgrounds, so state parks, county parks, Army Corps of Engineer parks, where we're typically in places with developed campgrounds, but we're in very natural feeling places and usually in uh, camp spaces that have a lot of privacy, but we still have amenities. Um, and those are a great sweet spot for us when boondocking's not an option, like when it's really hot out and we want air conditioning. Um, so that's usually where we end up spending the most of our time in a lot of our years, especially when we're on the East Coast, um, is because state parks, county parks, and Army Corps of Engineer parks are very abundant, and there are some lovely, lovely options for those. So the comment from blaze of i was gonna skip okay that one. okay uh, we don't do urban boondocking so we don't yeah have i was just gonna say we have i used to do a lot of urban boondocking but, but we don't a drink long when time. Yeah. um let's see greg says part-time transitioning to full timing as travel nurses any surprises to expect um i've never been a travel nurse <laughs> so i can't and, answer that and actually we've never been part-timers really yeah, we've, we've never been, been part full, full-timer since day one so, bought an rv um, um, but Greg, you might want to go look back at our, um, about a, a year and a half ago, we did a video on the 10, su uh, 10 things that suck about full-time RVing. Um, you can find it at technomadia.com, sucky RVing, or you can find it in this playlist on YouTube. Uh, but we shared the 10 things that suck about RVing. That might be a fun one to go and, and, and look, o look at. Roy and Betty, four months into full timing and we're discouraged some days. Oh. A second. How do you talk yourself up to have a great day? Um, I don't. I allow myself to feel icky for a day and I allow myself to pout and I let it pass because I feel that the more that I stuff it and don't acknowledge that it's a sucky day, the more it lingers and I can't get past it. I just kind of stuff you don't have it. You don't have sucky days. Oh, no, I, I do. <laughs> but I, 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 and actually sometimes in one of the things that I can do to kind of reset sucky days is, is go out and like run and just get body endorphins going or something mm -hmm. um if, if if i'm really feeling ah, that's actually mm -hmm. you know doing something big and physical and or tackling a project that i could accomplish and be like done <laughs> beat it <laughs> killed yeah. you know that that just is a kind of a reset point uh johnson says what reasons do we have for not tanking an rv to burning man now through here i didn't say don't take rvs to burning man they're yeah. great for burning man i'm not taking my bus to burning again man. we took it in the beginning Again, we've taken all of our rvs to burning man um i'm not taking my bus there um because we've gone through a fresh engine rebuild we have done fresh paint we've done a complete renovation and the desert is harsh it's an alkaline dried lake bed and the um, dust settles everything. everywhere it's everywhere it's a lot of cleanup and i truly believe and it's something that if you don't clean up completely it can permeate into your engines and and rubber and things like that that can cause you mechanical breakdowns years later um, we just put too much effort and work into our bus and, and, to yeah. put it through that harshness anymore. I would go get a beater RV and take it to Burning Man. Right. Um, but, but, but go to Burning Man. If you haven't been, go to Burning Man. Yes. Uh, Jack wants to know, um, do you prefer the bus or the boat? Yes. We love them both. <laughs> yeah. Or else we wouldn't still keep doing this. We love our bus, even though we did we did the trip in May in it. Um, reaffirmed that we love the RV. We just don't like a, a week on the road in three mm. locations with long work. Um, but we love, we still love RVing, and we're looking forward to mixing up between the two. Um, and we have no intentions of ditching one or the other. We're loving the new lifestyle of boating, but uh, we also yeah, I'm looking forward to our. Ne I'm, lo I'm looking forward to actually the next question from CSI Tech of how do you break up the monotony of driving long distances like over the Great Plains and Oregon and stuff. I've actually been kind of fantasizing about a, you know getting back out to the big long open highways of the West with long you know. Hours long of just driving the bus. <laughs> do, 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 do. Uh, you know, I'm eager to get back to that at some point. And those are some of the most fun drives. It's beautiful out there. And how do you break up, break up the monotony is don't drive long days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we don't like to drive more than a couple hours a day. Um, and podcasts and um, awesome soundtracks, too. It's, mm -hmm. you know, that's that, those are the things that make a drive great. Yeah. I don't see any more questions. Oh, I got one coming in from Pat. Okay. I think it's time to start wrapping this up. Wow, 257 people. Woohoo! Thank you, people. A lot. That's a lot of people. My goodness. And I want to apologize because, like this, this was 
because we were so busy with the Davit project, we kind of pulled this together last minute and really yeah, I got the camera set up like three minutes yeah. before we went on the air. So <sighs> Pat <laughs> says when boondocking, do you worry about theft? Um, if I were um, worried about theft, then I don't need to be there. It's as simple as that. Yeah. If your spidey sense is tingling, Leave. trust it. And in general, I mean, people look out for each other out in the desert and, um, I have not heard hardly any bad stories. Um, yeah, if, if you're not feeling good in a place, just yeah. leave it. But, you know, be, be smart too. Chain up and lock up things that are easy grab and go stuff. Like, you know, don't leave a generator where that doesn't have a chain around it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, all right. I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to say this was uh, uh, a wrap. Oh, uh -oh. something from Chris. Chris. Okay, so. So we're, we're pre-saying goodbye, and um, and thank you guys all for tuning in, and hope you enjoyed this. Hope this is useful and interesting. Um, we like to hang out like this sometimes, and um, and sometimes we actually get burned out for sharing too much. So we got to kind of strike a balance yes. of that, yeah, too. Yeah, we do get burned out for sharing too much. <laughs> um, um, oh, final question. How much do you hire out? Versus do-it-yourself oh, um, upgrades. Uh, we mix it up. We mix it up. Like, like doing our Davit is a perfect thing. Is Rather than hire somebody to install it, we did it ourselves, but we hired Someone to the guy it. to help basically who had a big drill and an hour of time. So, so To assist. Yeah, to assist. So it was, it was you know, you know we, 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 we like every th project we do, we like to understand fully. And some things we don't have the skills or the tools, so we'll hire and just kind of learn from. And other things we tackle ourselves. It's, we kind of strike a good balance. All right, someone says, if someone wanted to send us a bottle of wine, are you sweet or dry? We, we tend to like red, but uh, we're not going to have a shipping address for a while. <laughs> so if you would like to send some wine, which we do have so appreciate if you want to send some thanks our way, there is a leave a tip button on the bottom of every page at technomadia.com. Uh, we do not do these for income generation, so any contributions you send are... It goes to the wine fund, basically. It goes to the wine and dine fund. It's all for extras. Yeah. This is our after hours time sharing yeah. with you guys. Our, our, RV Mobile Internet is work. This is fun. That's why we're not... We, what we won't take internet questions while we're hanging out in these chats. So that's over on the work side of our lives. But yes, we do have a brand new YouTube channel. Well, it's kind of not brand new. Uh, the Mobile Internet Resource Center, if you want to join that one as well. If you do want to keep up with our mobile internet content. Um, but yeah, we're going to call it an evening. Thank you for joining in with us. And uh, have a great evening. Uh-oh, I'm empty. You said he drinks <laughs> Good night. Right. Do you want to you want to continue on or? Oh, we're gonna do an after party. You want to do after party? We can just end the archive here, or we this can. Is, this is how's we do an after party with YouTube Live? I guess we could do an after party. I can just cut it out later. Okay, so I won't stop this, or I don't know how this works actually. Should I stop this and just go back to our regular YouTube Live? No, because I don't want to. Because you lose everybody.